Wow, wow, wow. Morena Fano. Yo, isn't it good to be together, eh? What an anointing in the house this morning. What a week it's been. If you're visiting for the first time this morning, I want to welcome you. On behalf of my faith city, Fano, we welcome you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We trust you'll be blessed this morning. Please hang around afterwards for a coffee or a tea and just mix with the Fano. It would be nice to get to know you a little bit more. Faith City, what a week it's been. What a two week, what a, what a past two weeks. Um, if I wasn't standing here this morning, I wouldn't know whether it was Saturday or Sunday or Wednesday or Tuesday. It's been an extremely busy, eventful past two weeks. We have buried loved ones. We have cast out demons and set captives free. We've prayed for the sick. We've rejoiced at the birth of babies. We've mourned at grave sites. We've uh, rejoiced at uh, new relationships and restored marriages. And uh, we've shed tears over broken relationships. And uh, we rejoice at God's blessing that in the midst of it all, He blesses us with a bunch of cows to hand out some meat. And uh, you all know the story behind that. I want to thank that amazing human being who said to me a couple of months ago, God wants me to give you some cows. Um, you're going to get some meat. Isn't it good? My joke I uh, passed to uh, S this morning. I said, just tell them that uh, God saved all the fillet on the ark. He didn't save the lettuce and the salad. But anyway, it's not true. Okay. It's not good theology. But anyway, it's just it's, it's good theology for me to justify my excessive meat eating. Amen. God is good. I can tell you what a type of what the week it's been. I've actually left my Bible at home. Can you believe it? But that's okay. I mean, I can't believe it. I'm like, that thing's, I'm joined to it. It's on my desk at home, but that's okay. God is good. Amen. Of course, um, we had the funeral of uh, Polly's uh, dad on Monday, and then um, we bid farewell to Holleen yesterday. Um, our sister in Christ, who's been part of this fellowship for more than 20 plus years. And um, we send our love, our gratitude, our blessings to uh, Janine and Charlie and their Fano for um, just giving us their mum to be part of this Fano for so long. What an incredible, incredible family. Please pray for them that God will rejuvenate them and replenish them and refresh, uh, refresh them, as well as um, uh, Pauli and uh, Tupo as well. Uh, they buried uh, Pauli's dad on Monday. We were at the funeral, myself and S and a few others. But gee, what a week. What a week it's been. It's been an incredible week. And the weeks are a week of highs and a week of lows, of being on the top of a mountain and celebrating breakthrough from cancer and then getting uh, a diagnosis. And we are we, we receive your prayer for Mike. Um, with Dave's breakthrough, we're gonna, uh, you know, a, a, a testimony is an invitation for repetition. Mike, you know, Mike and Lucina, Mike's uh, diagnosis has been pretty awful. Um, his diagnosis is that, he's, that the cancer in his body has spread, and uh, they've given him a time period. But uh, God will have the last word. Amen. 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 And I want to just say this to you. I stood at the uh, gravesite of, of Holleen yesterday and had the, the honor and the privilege of officiating at the gravesite. And I read a passage of scripture, and I want to read, start off this morning's message, which is that uh, the bride get, is getting herself ready, part two. Um, I want to read you a passage of scripture that I read at the gravesite. And then we're going to go from there. Amen? Are you ready? Paul the Apostle said in the book of Ephesians that... The bride of Christ is to be washed in the word of Christ, in the word of God. And that's what I want to do this morning. It's just through the grace of God this morning and through the power of the Holy Ghost is wash you in God's word and encourage you this morning through the power of God's word. Amen. Because we, uh, at times we can, we can step back and wonder what on earth is going on. One is healed, one is not. One breaks through one stumbles and falls. 
We stand at grave sites and we wonder what is going on. We look at the conflict that goes on around us and we wonder, Lord, where are you? I um, received a phone call a couple of weeks ago from a man in America. He said, I heard you know how to cast out demons. So, yeah, in the name of Jesus. <laughs> but he said, uh, I've, I've, I've got a sister in the city and um, uh, would you meet up with her and pray with her? Uh, the church that they're part of doesn't quite, uh, I don't think they quite believe in those sort of things. They're cessationists, which simply means they don't believe that the gifts of the Holy Spirit are for today. And I gathered with him and, and, and his sister, and uh, I must be very honest with you, I was very tired, and I felt a little bit run off my feet. I had no strength in and of myself. Um, and uh, I just remember walking into the room and just saying, Jesus, just give me confidence in your name and confidence in your blood. Because if this is going to be based on my energy and my strength, I'm going to get a hiding. And uh, this poor young lady was very, very, very troubled. And um, began to pace up and down and speak with a different voice and all sorts of things are going on. And I said, okay, here we go. I just stood up. It's in the name of Jesus, be quiet. I'm not talking to you. I'm talking to what's around you. Just be quiet in the name of Jesus. Get to do business in Jesus' name. You know, when you've got confidence in Christ, you don't have to shout or jump up and down or remonstrate or demonstrate or sweat, but you just have confidence in Christ, in His name and His blood. And she was set free. You know, and, um, and uh, a lot of things actually happened, but there was a lot going on. And so here I am standing yesterday at the gravesite for the body of Holin. And all the fauna were there. And I read a passage from 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And reading from verse 51. I want to encourage you with these words. Listen, I tell you a mystery. And so I'm asking all of you to listen this morning with the eyes of your heart. Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep but we will all be changed. Now, the word sleep was used for death, the physical death of the body. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality. And when the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, He gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Let nothing move you. Always give yourself fully to the work of the Lord. Always give yourself fully to the work of the Lord. Because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. What does all this mean? We laid Harleen's body to rest in the ground. From dust she came to dust she is returning. Her body, her earth suit. It's like the memory stick with all the data on. If I gave you a memory stick with no data, what are you going to, is there any value in the memory stick? There's limited value in the memory stick. But the whole life story, the essence, the energy, the, the, the spirit, the soul, the character, the personality is all what was contained in that. Amen? And when Adam sinned, atrophy, sin and death entered onto this planet. He was born for immortality. He was created to be immortal. He was given an immortal body that had no corruption or decay in it. It wouldn't grow old and turn to dust. It was because of the sin in the garden with, with that entered into the body of Adam. And so we all grow old. 
We all eventually turn to the ground, return to the ground, our bodies, be it through burial or be it through cremation. Somebody asked me recently, is it biblical or unbiblical to be created? The Bible is silent, doesn't say a word. But it does say, from dust you came, from dust you will return. And my answer was this, be at peace, brother. Cremation will get your ashes to ashes much quicker than the other way. So let's not split hairs here and bring condemnation where it's not necessary. It was a very valid question, very real question. It was turmoil within a family that you shouldn't cremate or burn a body. Well, I think God is bigger than our limited understanding. Bodies get blown up and shipwrecked and eaten by sharks and animals and all sorts of things. God, well, he knows, he knows, he knows. He's got your DNA, your whole genetic code somewhere. And he'll just say, let there be. And that's what this passage of Scripture is all about. And so yesterday we laid Holleen's body to rest, her earth suit, the suit that was given to her that was suitable to contain her on this earth. It was an earth suit that could see and hear and taste and touch and feel, and we love her because we knew her in the flesh. Amen? But her earth suit has gone back into the earth, and Holleen is with the Lord because of her faith in Jesus Christ. And that's what is being said in this passage. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. And it says here, in, in, in a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, my brothers and sisters, that trumpet call could take, it could sound today. It could sound now. Because Jesus Christ said that he will return, the end will come, when this gospel of the kingdom of God is preached to all nations, to the whole earth, as a testimony, not as a book of theology or a volume in a book, as a testimony to all nations, all ethnos, then the end will come. You and I don't know when that last sermon will be preached, or that last message will be, will be shared with that last individual that God has preordained, that will be part of the family of God, could take place in an instant at any time. And what he says here in this word, in 1 Corinthians, Paul in, in encouraging the church of Corinth, <clears throat> he says, when that trumpet call sounds, the perishable, your body that is perishing, will be clothed with the imperishable. He says that, and the mortal, the mortal body that dies, will be clothed with immortality. And when the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true, that death has been swallowed up in victory. Because the last enemy is death. Christ conquered death at the cross. And when he rose on the third day bodily from the grave and walked out of that grave in his body, his resurrection body, the scriptures clearly tell us that the graves of hundreds in Jerusalem burst open. And they came out of their graves in their resurrection bodies and entered into Jerusalem. That's the scripture. And they were the first fruits of what is to come. They were the first fruit. Jesus was the first fruit, and that was the first little crop of a demonstration to the world of Christ's victory at the cross over death that came into the Garden of Eden. And every single one of you, and that's what Paul is saying here, is that every single one of you, that's the time's going to come, if you have already if your body has fallen asleep and you've gone into the grave or been cremated, no matter where it is, or don't get hung up on all that stuff. But you will, if you, at the, at the shout of the archangel and the blast of the trumpet, which is actually what a, uh, the groomsmen would do when they came to announce to the village that the groom was coming to fetch his bride in Jewish weddings, they would run ahead of the groom and blast that trumpet. It was wedding speak while the bride's getting herself ready, doing good works. Not saved by good works, but saved for good works. And when that trumpet call sounds, if your body's in the grave, your spirit that is with Christ because you're a disciple, well, in a nanosecond, it says, in the twinkling of an eye, your resurrection, glorious, immortal, incorruptible physical body will be instantly reunited with you. 
And those that are alive, when that trumpet call sounds, you will, in a twinkling of an eye, your body will completely transform into your resurrection body. Never to decay, never to suffer, never to see disease, never to age. It will be your immortal, glorious, imperishable, incorruptible, supernatural body that you will have for eternity. And so when we stand at a gravesite, we are not without hope. We don't mourn as the world mourns. We mourn because the person we knew in the flesh is no more on this side of eternity. But we will see them again. There's some questions I cannot answer. People say, well, what is my body going to look like? Am I going to have more hair? What about cellulite and Botox and all those things? No, I think they just stop there. You're thinking earthly things. It will be a supernatural body. Jesus walked through walls. He could travel very quickly in his resurrection body. He could do things that were... Supernatural. That's why I love Superman. Because there's something in that that those movie directors have picked up that is eternal and supernatural. And so in verse 55, Paul says, So where, O death, is your victory? And where, O death, is your sting? So death no longer has victory over us, the death of the body. And although there's pain in death, there's no sting in death. Verse 56, the sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, He gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, Christ came to fulfill all the law, because we couldn't. And because He could and he received everything from the Father because he could, because he was without sin. As our older brother, according to the Scriptures, because he is. He is the first fruits of a, of a myriad of brothers and sisters, that's you and I, who are growing in maturity, where our older brother, the Son of God, is waiting for us to mature and grow into the full measure of his stature because he wants to play with us forever and rule and reign over his creation for eternity. And so he says, my brothers and sisters, let not your hearts be troubled. Don't let them be troubled. Trust in God the Father. Trust also in me because in my Father's mansion or my Father's house or my Father's presence, there's room for you, and I'm going to go and prepare a place for you, and I'm going to come back for you, and it's not to take you back somewhere you're going to be hanging on a cloud like a little fat cherub with wings playing a harp. He's coming back to this earth, and this earth is groaning and waiting in eager expectation for the sons and daughters of God to be revealed. And as you've, heard, as you've heard me say so often before, is that He hasn't come to take us away. He's come to give us Himself and to prepare us for the age that is to come. He's preparing us to rule. He's preparing us for thrones. He's preparing us to, to govern and lead for a period of, more than, a, period of a thousand years. On this earth, with a rejuvenated earth and seas and not the chaos we actually see on the earth today. And so he says in verse 58, Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Stand firm. Let nothing move you. Don't let anything or anyone move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. And so in part one last week, 
We looked at Revelation chapter 19. Let me summarize it, then I want to wash you in the word as to how important your labor actually is. But if we looked last week at Revelation chapter 19, it's beginning to come to the culmination of all things. Christ has already returned. He's already captured his bride to himself. And uh, the Revelation 19 says that his bride has made herself ready. Fine linen, her wedding garment has been given to her. Christ is fully righteous. He's fully just. He's without sin. He is fully man and he is fully God. 100% God, 100% man. God became a man. And when the God-man Jesus Christ died on the cross, 100% without sin and 100% righteous, through His death and the shedding of His blood, through faith and grace, He has given you His righteousness. He gives it to you. He impute. The word is impute. He imputes it to you because of your faith in Him. He gives you His right standing, and through His blood, you are now righteous. He justifies you. It's just as if you had never, ever sinned. That's what He gives you, and that is amazing grace. He doesn't give it to you today and take it tomorrow, and then give it to you the next day and take it away the day thereafter. It is your eternal condition because of your faith in Christ. You're no longer bent under the weight of the law. And under the weight of sin, you have a completely new nature, a completely new character. So stop reckoning with your old nature and going back. Because that's wrong. It's illegitimate for you to go back and keep looking at your failings and your shortcomings and your sins. That's exactly what the enemy wants you to do. You're a new creature with a new nature. And that nature is seen through the blood of Jesus Christ. You stand righteous. In Christ. And it is the accuser of the brethren, the accuser of the children of God, who will come and accuse you that you're not worthy and you're not righteous and you're not holy and you're just a sinner. And if you've got people who are telling you that or something in your ear that's whispering that into your mind, you have to go get behind me, Satan, and get your confidence back onto Christ and his blood and what he has done for you. Amen. Incredible, incredible truth. And so the bride has been given linen. And Revelation 19 says, and that the linen stands for her righteous acts. Now I need to say this and give you, for those taking notes, just give you these references because they're very, very, very important. We are not saved by works. We are saved for works. I'm going to talk to you about the importance of doing good works. But the, before I do that, we are not saved by works. You can never be saved by anything that you do. And so under that first point, it is by grace that you have been saved. And the scriptural reference is Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. And what I'm about to say about works, the types of works, have to rest on the foundation of this truth. Number one, it is by grace you have been saved. In Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9 say this, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. Not by works. I think it's straightforward. Not by works so that no one can boast. That's pretty clear, isn't it? You can have good works, but no Christ. But I actually don't believe you can have Christ and, to me, and, and, and have no good works. Which is my second, uh, let's go to, uh, that's not my second point. Under this first point, 
Can we just turn to Hebrews chapter 6? We're going to read verses 1 and 2. If you could pull those up on the screen, please. Hebrews chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. Paul the Apostle is writing to you and I. And this is what he says in Hebrews chapter 6. He says, Therefore, let us leave the elementary teachings about Christ and go on to maturity. I want to pause there. That's intermediate school. The elementary. It's kindy. It's kindy. I don't even think it's intermediate school. This is the teaching in kindy. So Paul is saying to them, there's some teachings in the Bible that are actually for kinder. They're for new Christians, new born again Christians. Elementary teachings. He says, let us leave the elementary teachings about Christ and go on to maturity, not laying again the foundation of repentance from acts that lead to death. I'll come back to that. And of faith in God, instruction about baptisms, the laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. What he is saying is this. Elementary 101 teaching to new Christians should be repent, uh, repentance from dead acts or dead works. I'll speak about that in a moment. Teachings on faith in God, instruction about baptisms, which are water baptisms and Holy Spirit baptisms, the laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead, which I started off sharing with you this morning, and the eternal judgment that is to come. He's saying all baby Christians should be so fully versed with those. Let's go on to more mature things. Pretty interesting, eh? So you should be able to teach anybody about these basic doctrines. But it says here, repentance from acts that lead to death. Or repentance, other, other translations say repentance from dead works. You know what a dead work is? And we need to know this teaching. A dead work is something you do to make yourself acceptable and pleasing to God. A dead work is when you try and do what only Christ could do. And the cross of Christ could do. When you, you try to make yourself acceptable and pleasing to God and worthy, it's a dead work and you need to repent of that. Because only Christ could deal with those things at the cross. Amen? Now the second point is this. The first one is that by grace you've been saved. The second point is that by grace you've been saved for good works. And so let's go to the book of James. You can go towards Revelation and then page to the left, and you'll get to James pretty quick. Or scroll on your screen or hit search. Isn't it an incredible thing that by grace you've been saved? But the second point is actually very, very important. In the book of James, James chapter 2, reading from verses 14 to 26, Listen to this carefully. What good is it, my brothers, if a man claims to have faith and has no deeds? Can such faith save him? Suppose a brother or sister is, is, is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to him, go, I wish you well, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about his physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if not accompanied by action, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Or you have faith, I have works. Show me your faith without deeds, or show me your faith without works, and I'll show you my faith by what I do. You believe that there's one God. Good. Even the demons believe that and shudder. You foolish man. Do you want evidence that faith without works is useless? Was not our ancestor Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and his actions were working together. And his faith was made complete by what he did. And to him, that says, sorry, and the scripture was fulfilled that says, Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. Can you say righteousness? And he was called God's friend. You see, verse 24. Now, this sounds like a contradiction to the previous verse. 
The previous verse in Ephesians says it's by grace through faith you've been saved and not by works so no person can boast. But here the apostle James makes this comment in verse 24 that a person is justified by what he does and not by faith alone. And there were many theologians that actually thought this should not be in the Bible because it sounds like a works salvation. Because the word justification means it's through the blood of Christ, it's just as if you have never sinned when God the Father deals with you. I want you to think about that for a moment. That's why you can have confidence to enter into the most holy place by the blood of Jesus. Because when you enter into, according to Hebrews, the most holy place into the presence of God the Father by the blood of Jesus, God sees you and you are justified just as if you have never sinned. God the Father does not see your sin. Incredible. And so James says, a person is justified by what he does and not by faith alone. Are those passages in conflict? They most definitely are not. Because if you are saved, we should... See and know that you are saved. You see the bride who's been given this gown to wear that is righteous, but then she clothes herself in righteous acts because she is righteous. And so when we look at the Scriptures and we understand this, is that our motivation in life, our motivation to do the work of God is not based on trying to be righteous and pleasing to God. We do those things because we are already righteous. We are already pleasing. We are already holy. We are already accepted. We are already approved. We are already seated with God in heavenly places. And it is from that position that we do all that we do. Fully accepted, fully approved because of what Christ did at the cross. Never for His approval. And when you do that, when your motivation is wrong, it's a dead work. You need to repent of it. Amen? Isn't that good news? It should lift religion and, and, and heaviness and expectation from us. Let me wash over you with this, the word, with this. You know, Jesus commands good works from you. He said in Matthew chapter 5, if you're not going to have time to get this down, we'll, we'll post this up. In Matthew chapter 5 from verse 13, don't put it up on the screen because I'm going to run ahead very quickly. Jesus said, you're the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled by men. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. In verse 16, Jesus says, in the same way, let your light shine before men that they may see your good, good deeds that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven, that they may see your righteous acts and praise your Father in heaven. In chapter 6, the words of Jesus. Jesus goes on, He says, be careful. We can pull this one up, please. Matthew chapter 6, verse 1. Jesus says, be careful not to do your acts of righteousness before men to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. The key in that verse is that Jesus directly says, be careful not to do your acts of righteousness before men with the wrong motive. I love there, he says, acts of righteousness. Revelation 19, clothe yourself in acts of righteousness. Jesus calls them acts of righteousness. They're righteous acts, and we looked at those last week. He says, don't don't do them in the presence of men for the sake of getting recognition from men. He has an appeal to the younger generation. In fact, the the World Wide Web generation. Consider when you post your achievements and the things you do as to what is your motivation for posting. Now, you can promote a ministry And I think we should be doing that and we need to be using the World Wide Web with wisdom. But pause and reflect and ask yourself, what is the motivation for this? Is it for recognition and acceptance 
and approval. If that is the motivation, well, then you have your reward. And your reward is the recognition and acceptance and approval from man. And that's what Jesus is saying here. Be careful not to do your, I love it, acts of righteousness before men, to be seen by them. If you do, you'll have your reward from your Father in heaven. And he goes on to say that when you give to the needy, don't announce it. When you give money, don't announce it. I love the man who gave us the meat. He said, I don't want anybody to know about the, who I am. People who give, they, the left hand doesn't know what the right hand is doing. Uh, he's making a distinction between acts of righteousness and your motivation for doing them. Do you know that Paul the Apostle, in his writings, he says that Christ Jesus has created you to do good works, which God has prepared in advance for you to do. He said to Titus, be ready to do whatever is good. He went on to Titus and he said, be careful to, to tell the church to devote themselves to doing what is good. He said to Titus, tell them to learn to devote, yeah, to devote themselves to doing what is good. To all the women in the church, you know what Paul the Apostle said? He said this in 1 Timothy. He said, I want the woman to dress modestly, with decency and propriety, not with braided hair or gold or pearls or expensive clothes, but clothe yourself with good deeds that are appropriate for women who profess to worship God. Once again, motive. Does it mean you can't wear nice clothes? I don't, just, I don't think it says that. Once again, it's getting to the heart of the matter, which is the matter of the heart. He's saying, woman, you're beautiful, you look beautiful, but make sure that your true beauty comes from clothing yourself in righteous acts. To widows, the widows of the church, you heard me say last week that a good deed in the city is for the church to take care of widows and orphans. All of us to look after them, whether they're part of this household or not, we should be looking after them, asking God how we can support and encourage. We saw that last week. But listen to what, the, what God says through Paul to Timothy. He says, No widow may be put on the list of widows unless she is over 60, has been faithful to her husband, and is well known for her good deeds such as bringing up children, showing hospitality, washing the feet of the saints, helping those who are in trouble, and devoting herself to all kinds of good works. To the rich in the church, Paul said this, command those who are rich, that's financially rich, in this present world, not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. In other words, if you're rich financially, enjoy it. That's what he says. He's given it to you for your enjoyment. Enjoy it. And then he says, command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. In this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. Remember treasures in heaven where moth and rust destroy? What's your bank account looking like for the next thousand years? Yo. Oh, gosh. When you give a cup of water to someone who's thirsty, ching, ching your balance goes up. When you give someone the shirt off your back because they haven't got any clothes, ching, ching, the balance goes up. When you break the fangs of injustice, and you go and deal to some injustice, and you, you dish out biblical justice in an unjust situation, ching, ching, goes up. You're storing up treasure in heaven. When you look after the poor, ching, ching, you're lending to God. Not this rubbish you get from the banks. They take your money, charge you to hold your money, and then give you 1% interest. They manipulate it all. They rip you off, charge you all the bank fees. They use your money. They give you this, this, this advice that you just got to save, 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 buy a house, spend your whole life paying it off, put your little, your little bit extra if you can in a Kiwi saver, and all that sort of stuff. That's a whole system that is, is stacked against you and I. Hardly works. It's a rip-off. 
Yes, it's a big ripoff. It's a con, global con. They take your money and they buy, they buy assets that produce income. They buy properties and all sorts of things. Here's the point. When you store up treasures in heaven, I would rather be lending, giving to the poor and lending to God for what's to come. It's true. I think his bank is better than mine. Better than ASB, BNZ, ANZ. Would you agree? And it goes on. Peter the Apostle said that the world needs to see your good deeds and glorify God. Peter went on to say that by doing good in the world that you are placed in, you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish men and women. And it goes on and on and on. We saw that, that Job himself, we saw this last week, that Job, when he went into the city gates and he, and he walked into the city, that uh, the, everybody kept silent. It says that the, the tongues of the young men would stick to their mouths. They would stand up when Job came in. He was, had such manner and such public recognition and stature that God even said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? And we saw in chapter 29, where it tells us why Job had such manner. Because the widow sang when he was near, because he would take care of them. The orphans would sing for joy. Why? Because he would take care of them. Those that were in prison, he comforted. Those that had no clothes, he fed them. He snapped the fangs of injustice. He, I don't know how he did that. And as I shared last week, there's some things, I think particularly the men of this church, we've got to find some justice ministries for the end of this year and into next year. We've got to find some things. We've got to identify and recognize the pain and the injustice in our city, and we have to do something about it. The men have got to get talking, get around a cup of coffee together and say, what does this mean for me? Good works, righteous works. And so we see this, the scriptures over and over. Jesus demand, demands good works, righteous works. Paul in his writings does. John in his writings does. James in his writings does. And then the day comes. And let me start wrapping this up. The day is going to come. And it is coming soon. When we're going to have to give an account. It's coming. Because one of the things that actually happens when the trumpet blast is sounded, there is something that's coming after that, and it's called the judgment seat of Christ. Not the great white throne judgment to remove this, the sinners from the world and separate all that stuff from, from the righteous. There's the judgment seat of Christ, which each individual, every one of us are going to give an account for what we've done in the body. And it's not for the purpose of punishment or for the purpose of your salvation. Because you are saved. You are saved because of Christ. But it is for the purpose of reward for the age that is to come. Isn't it incredible? Absolutely awesome, isn't it? And so God gives us courage to our hearts and He strengthens you in every good, for every good deed and word. He gives you His word so that you may be profoundly equipped for every good work. He gives you His presence. He gives you His Holy Spirit. He gives you His anointing. He gives you wisdom. He gives you grace. He gives you graces. He gives you seed for sowing financially. He's able to make all grace abound to you, so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, this is in terms of money, you will abound in every good work. And he doesn't want you to eat the seed. He wants you to eat the bread, but not the seed. And too often we wonder why there's no breakthroughs because we're eating the seed. He wants you to, when he, when he blesses you, you've got to take some of it's for bread and some of it's for seed. And what is the seed? It's to sow. In 2 Corinthians, he says that God is able to make all grace abound to you so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you'll abound in every good work. Now, he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. Isn't that beautiful? Isn't that incredible? Absolutely awesome. I'm going to ask if you'd please stand.
let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds or good works. Before you look at the screen, let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds and good works. Let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing. It's plenty. Would you agree? I'm preaching to the choir. I know there's some people here not here today because they're exhausted and they need to be at home. Let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. The story ends with Revelation chapter 22. Behold, I'm coming soon. And these letters are in red. These are the words of Jesus himself. I want you to picture this. Frankie, can you get onto the keyboard, please? I want you to picture this. Christ, 2,000 years ago, said to his disciples, let not your hearts be troubled. He said, trust in God, but trust also in me. In my Father's house is room for you. I'm going to go and prepare a place for you and for all those who come after you. He was talking to the 11. The 11 apostles. We know what happened with Judas. He's talking to the 11. And so for 2,000 years, the creator of the heavens and the earth, of all that is good, has been preparing for his wedding. He's been preparing for his bride. He's saying, get ready, get ready, get ready, get ready, get ready, get ready. Be busy. There's an activity in waiting. Women understand this more than men. You're getting ready for your that wedding day, all the activity, get ready, get ready, get ready. Oh, look, they're taking care of the weak. They're taking care of the poor. They're encouraging one another towards love and good deeds. They're using their gifts and their talents. They're using their skill. They're using their knowledge of architecture and medicine, whatever it may be. They're using their vocations for good works. For my glory and my glory alone. They're strengthen, strengthening the weak. Visiting the prisoners. Setting captives free. They're doing good. Their light is shining. Like a lamp on a hill. They salt in their light. And Christ says, behold, faith city, I'm coming soon. I'm coming soon. My reward is with me. My reward is with me. Not salvation. It's the reward that he's got for you. My reward is with me and I will give to everyone according to what he has done. And let me re-emphasize, it's not your salvation because you've already received your salvation. If you've received Christ as Lord and Savior, you have the greatest gift of all gifts, it's the gift of eternal life in Christ Jesus. But he's got far more for you. And it can just be a cup of water for a thirsty person. A kind gesture across your fence with your neighbor. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for my brothers and sisters. Lord, I see a day that is coming when together we're going to do some mighty exploits together in our city. We're going to break the fangs of injustice and see far more lost people saved through this house. We're going to hear that freedom bell ring and ring and ring for those who have come to know Christ, for those who have been saved out of darkness into the kingdom of His Son. We're going to hear that bell ring when the sick are healed 
when people are set free from financial bondage and there's financial breakthrough. Lord, we hear and we're going to see that bell ring, Lord God. We're going to do mighty exploits together, Father, in the name of Jesus. We're going to talk to the Ministry of Social Development, Lord, and see how we can help, what we can do, what we can do for the broken and the hurting in our communities, in our streets, in our schools, in our government, in local government, wherever you place us, Lord God. That bell's going to ring, Lord, as we advance as one, as one for the sake of the gospel. So Heavenly Father, I pray your blessings upon my brothers and sisters. I pray you'll bless them, that you will strengthen them. You will strengthen their hands. For those, Lord God, who are exhausted, I pray, Lord God, you'll give them strength and wisdom and breakthrough. For those that are needing breakthrough financially, Lord God, let the breakthrough come in the name of Jesus Christ. For those that are in the wrong jobs, Lord God, would you close one door and open up another? For those that are being exploited, Lord God, would you actually bring justice, economic justice into their labor and their reward, Lord God. For those that are needing breakthrough in their health, let health come in the name of Jesus Christ. For the weak that are here this morning, would you strengthen them and give them a second win for the road ahead, Lord God. Bless them and strengthen them. For the older generation, those 60s and above, Lord God, would you put strength in their bones, strength in their hearts. Would retirement fly out the window, Lord God? Would the concept of waiting vanish and disappear? I pray that you'll breathe life on their wisdom, life, Lord, onto their experiences, life onto their maturity, Lord God. And may they breathe courage and strength into a younger generation, Lord. And for the younger generation, Lord God, who have become a little bit wayward, because of the things of this world. Lord, would you capture their hearts and capture their minds and would, would you give them the resolve of Daniel and Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego who resolved to main, remain pure in a polluted world. Father, I ask that in the name of Jesus. Do something new within us, Lord. Do something new within us, Lord God. Bring around a mini revival, a fire in this place. A fire in this place, Lord God. Lord, I'm asking that the men of this household, you'd ignite their hearts in a huge way. In a huge way. That you turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the children to their fathers. And that there'd be a good crop of orphans in our city that through us will discover fatherhood. I ask this in Jesus' precious name. And lastly, Lord, I thank you for the meat for those cows. I thank you for those cows in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Bless you all. May God bless you. May He keep you. May His face shine upon you. Bless you. Amen. Have a great day.